Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is John Morse. I am the board president of the World Affairs Council of Western Massachusetts, and I would like to welcome you all here to uh, tonight's Instant Issues After Hours event um, featuring Dr. Mark Jacobson, who will be speaking to us about political warfare, propaganda, and disinformation. Uh, once again, in the proud tradition of Instant Issues events, a rather timely topic for us uh, to be talking about tonight. Um, I'd first like to do a special thanks um, to Mary Beth Bergeron. Uh, I uh, have missed the past two Instant Issues events uh, due to my travel schedule, and Mary Beth, um, as, as those of you who were there, uh, very ably filled in, and I'm very thankful to, for, to Mary Beth for, for doing that for us and, and for me. Um, I'd also like to thank our sponsors, um, starting with our traditional sponsors for have uh, been with us for quite a while, uh, Sir Speedy and the Wilbraham and Munson Academy. And of course, special thanks also to NAI Plotkin, uh, the managers of this building who have done so much to support our efforts over the years. Um, having been away, this is my first opportunity to welcome two new sponsors uh, to the Instant Issues program. Uh, first to uh, Glenn Meadow, who is now uh, supporting us in this. Uh, as some of you know, in one of my other incarnations, uh, I am the board president of the Mason Wright Foundation, uh, which, like Glenn Meadow, is uh, dedicated to uh, helping seniors uh, who require assistance uh, in life, and they are, uh, we see them very much as, as our um, colleagues in this endeavor to uh, help seniors uh, who require assistance in daily living. Uh, and I'm very happy to see them joining us in, in uh, supporting the work of the World Affairs Council. Um, and also, uh, a new sponsor is the Wealth Management and Trust Services team at Greenfield Savings Bank. Uh, again, another group that um, does a lot of good work in supporting seniors. Their uh, Trust Services uh, division um, provides um, uh, services as uh, trustees and as executors and uh, being uh, holding powers of attorney, and they are just, I will also say, uh, I happen to know, just very, very nice, friendly people, um, and uh, we try only to do business with nice, friendly people, uh, and I very much look forward to having them uh, be with us at an upcoming event so you can uh, meet the principles of, of this group. They, I say they, are, they, are, they are good people. Um, I want to thank um, board members who are present uh, this evening. Uh, Jeremy Cole from Cole TV, who is man manning the camera uh, in the back. Um, also, Ashanta Smith from uh, on our board, and uh, past president Ken First is also here, um, and Gary. Br um, <laughs> Lafort. I almost called you Gary Breton. Um, uh, Gary Lafort um, is also here, and I think. Um, that's it for, for board members. And I also want to thank very much John and Meg Young. Those were the people who were out uh, registering you. Um, John Young, due to our term limits, has just cycled off the board but continues to serve us uh, in, in helping with registering. So um, thank you very much, John and, and Meg. Um, just a, a note about upcoming events. Um, on November 4th, Dr. Kavita Corey, who is the uh, Ruth Lawson Professor of Politics and the Carol Hoffman Collins Director um, of the Mount Holyoke College McCulloch Center for Global Initiatives, uh, will be speaking to us about security challenges and ethnic conflicts in South Asia. Uh, so again, if you know the track record of the World Affairs Council and its instant issues. Um, I'm sorry, South Asia, you will probably have some kind of crisis right about November 4th. <laughs> um, that will be at our normal noontime uh, event. It'll be at the brown bag uh, lunchtime discussion on November 4th. Uh, our speaker tonight is Dr. Uh, Mark R. Jacobson, who is the John J. McCloy, class of 1916, professor of American institutions and international diplomacy. Uh, at Amherst College. Uh, Dr. Jacobson has more than 20 years of experience in the federal government, international organizations, and academia, working on some of those complex and politically sensitive national security issues facing our country. Uh, he's a recognized expert on U.S. foreign policy and national security, as well as the dynamics of international conflict and the use of military force, and has served as a policymaker, a diplomat, an academic, and a member of the armed forces. Uh, since November of 2017, he has served as the senior policy advisor uh, at Katzwitz Benson Torres, LLC, 
uh, where as part of their Government Affairs and Strategic Council Group, he helps advise on and resolve complex and politically sensitive issues for clients as well as representing clients before the U.S. government. Um, Dr. Jacobson has also had a long service as a public servant, most recently held appointments as uh, senior advisor to the Secretary of Defense and special assistant to the Secretary of the Navy. Uh, previously, he served in Afghanistan as uh, the Deputy NATO Representative and Director of International Affairs at the International Security Assistance Force. And in those roles, he advised Generals uh, David Petraeus and Stanley McChrystal on international policy dynamics of their mission. And earlier in his career, he served in the Pentagon in multiple roles and was in the office on September 11th, uh, 2001, when American Airlines Flight 77 crashed into that building. Uh, on Capitol Hill, Dr. Jacobs has worked with Senator Carl Levin on the staff of the Senate Armed Services Committee, where he participated in inquiry into the treatment and interrogation of detainees in U.S. custody. And as a combat veteran, his military service includes times as both an Army and a Navy reservist. I don't know how you do that, but... Um, uh, including mobilizations to Bosnia in 1996 and Afghanistan in 2006. Who do you root for in the Army-Navy game? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> um, and today he will be speaking to us on Past Was Prologue, Today's Struggle Against Political Warfare, Propaganda, and Disinformation in the United States. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Jacobson. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. I, you know, hearing the full biography, I think it's now time to retire. It's, it's <laughs> um, but it, it's always it's always nice to, to get a chance to get out of the classroom and frankly get out of the uh, Washington Beltway and, and talk with folks who uh, they, I, I just don't always get a chance to speak with about some of the pressing issues of the day. And I, and I promise you, I, I'm not going to uh, continue this uh, cycle of talking about an issue and then getting a crisis. I, I promise you, we are already in a crisis uh, posed by disinformation propaganda. Uh, and the likes, but uh, I've had the chance to uh, live now part-time up in Western Massachusetts for the last, uh, just about 12 months now, uh, first commuting and now with my family up here full-time. Uh, and it really is nice and it's wonderful again uh, to, to get a chance to see that World Affairs Councils are still operating and uh, still getting good audiences and, and people are still discussing these issues. Uh, you'll, it won't surprise you as you hear me uh, go through my talk this evening that I think one of the solutions to the complex problems, whether in our own nation or helping our elected officials understand what we want uh, to see from them, is having these discussions at a community level, having an informed uh, citizenry, and uh, yes, oh, is it, is it off? So quick the. Can you hear me better now? Of course, okay. Oh, all right, so I'll just speak loudly. Um, Better. Okay, great. I, um, I'm a huge advocate of uh, bringing civi civics education back into our K-12 through schools. And I would add to that, and I'll talk about this a bit later, uh, both historic and media literacy as well. Um, I think that if we don't understand how our government functions, if we don't understand uh, the, the history of our own nation, much less that of, of other nations, we're going to make less uh, well-informed decisions. And uh, uh, as I tell my students up at Amherst, not all of whom are going to uh, follow my path into uh, public service, that it doesn't matter whether you're on Wall Street, Silicon Valley, uh, or stay around in, in, in the Pioneer Valley area, um, history matters. And understanding the past will help you to understand the present. Hence the, uh, the larger title of my talk, Past is Prologue. Now, um, when I also speak to my students, I have to remind them a little bit about definitions. And uh, for years now, uh, even for myself, whenever I hear the term propaganda, I think of something negative or I think of lies. You know, the image that, that some people may have when they hear propaganda are the Lenny Reifenstahl films and, and Nazi soldiers marching, lies, deceit, George Orwell's 1984 and Big Brother. But propaganda is a neutral term. Propaganda in and of itself is simply a form of persuasive communication, uh, no less good or bad than Plato's rhetoric or diplomatic dialogue, uh, advocacy, marketing, or advertising. Um, of course, it's likely as soon as, as soon as human beings could communicate and, and have this sort of uh, 
uh, persuasive communication dialogue, they probably had to deal with disinformation, that is deliberately false information, and of course, misinformation, things that are later proven to be incorrect, and hopefully professional organizations, news organizations, uh, inform you that yes, we, we made a mistake. Uh, there's a certain big newspaper uh, down in Manhattan that's having some challenges right now with uh, reporting things that turn out not to be uh, correct later on, uh, and they're finding out they're, they're driving the news cycle. I, I hope you know what I'm talking about, but if not, it turns out this little uh, uh, back and forth between uh, Hillary Clinton and Tulsi Gabbard was based on a um, uh, mistaken or misquoted or poorly edited uh, interview that took place, and actually, um, Senator Clinton never said anything about uh, Tulsi Gabbard at all. Well, well, that's a little bit of a problem. Um, now, indeed, if we go back to the Bible, uh, in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, there we get our, not only our first propagandist, uh, thank you, uh, in the serpent, uh, but we also get our first purveyor of disinformation. Um, and, of course, the results were much more catastrophic for mankind then. We were, of course, expelled out of paradise and have been paying for it ever since. Uh, my, my, my point is that, uh, you know, this is not new. And in fact, it's not only entwined in our history, but entwined in, uh, in certain faiths as well, when, when we tell our stories about the beginnings of mankind. So if we start talking about the original sin, and then we start trying to compare it to what's happening in uh, 2019, there's some, there are some parallels going on. Uh, funny enough, uh, Mark Zuckerberg is testifying today, on, or testified today at Capitol Hill, and um, there's a great story out of his 2016 testimony where he apologized to senators and the public and noted that his greatest regret in running the company um, was that he didn't quite understand what was going on in 2016. And I'll, and I'll quote here. We expected the Russians to do a number of more traditional cyber attacks, which we did identify and notify the campaigns that they were trying to hack into them, but we were slow at identifying this new type of information operations. Mark Zuckerberg should not have dropped out of school. He should have taken more history classes. I present to you those new information operations. There was nothing new about it. These things have been going on for a long time. It's just that cyber is a new vector. It's no longer radio and TV. It's no longer, well, sometimes it is. Uh, sometimes it's leaflets even today. And I'll, I'll you know, talk about that in a bit. But the traditional and novel attack that we think it is is, is frankly an age-old form of communication. Now granted, the types of propaganda, specifically disinformation challenges uh, we have today, uh, were really, uh, really began about 500 years ago. It's uh, just a little past the five, uh, 500th anniversary of the Gutenberg printing press. And um, what happened uh, with, with the movable printing uh, type printing press, for those of you who remember uh, kind of your, your European history, uh, there was a gentleman named Martin Luther who took advantage of that uh, probably about 75 years after the existence of the printing press and was able to promote his 95 theses, uh, his critique of the Catholic Church and indulgences at the time. But um, I actually think it's important to note now in 2019 that historians are starting to go back and look, look at Martin Luther again and have realized, and they're looking at things you know, like this through the lens of Twitter, and they've realized that it wasn't simply the printing press, but it was Martin Luther's social network. In this case, pubs and breweries, the Twitter of his day. These were places where people gathered. These were, uh, there were pub keepers who agreed to post his 95 theses. Why? Let's get people in and they'll talk. And if they talk, they'll drink, they'll buy the beer. Uh, but also Martin Luther had an affinity for uh, pubs as well. Uh, and uh, well, that's a whole other lecture, but in any case, the important part was that this actually allowed the social network, uh, not just of uh, uh, those who were favorable to him in the religious community, but the pubs, that allowed his message to go viral. And as a friend of Martin Luther noted at the time, quote, hardly 14 days had passed when these propositions were known throughout Germany, and within four weeks, almost all of Christendom was familiar with them. This is as remarkable as a tweet that goes viral today, given the pace of communication. Now, of course, today, if we had our own Martin Luther, you know, it might get across all of Germany in four minutes and around the world in 14. But think of that in terms of the shock, and that's what you're talking about in terms of the beginning of uh, the Reformation. 
Now, um, in Political Magazine in uh, 2016, there was a great piece by journalist Jacob Soule. And uh, he noted that uh, along with Gutenberg and the printing press, fake news started to take off at this time. In fact, even before Luther's 95 Theses had gone viral, uh, the, uh, it started with things that you might be familiar with in terms of, um, and actually I think you can flip to the next slide uh, if I have it here. Um, these are a little later, but I'll get to them. But the first, uh, some of the first fake news, blood libel, anti-Semitic uh, anti rumors, um, based on false eyewitness accounts, that's something we still have today, and then spread by printed newsletter. Uh, where there was truth in learning, there has always been, there have always been lies and deception. Doesn't matter whether it's in the 15th century or the 19th century or even today. In fact, um, I couldn't find my copy of it, but back in 1983, TV Guide magazine, uh, if you, some of you will remember those, uh, the front cover, why are Americans so vulnerable to foreign propaganda? Um, and it was a legitimate story about how the news or the major news networks had been taken by uh, a rumor planted by foreign operatives that there was a Libyan hit squad out to get Ronald Reagan. Never happened. ABC News ran with the story because they wanted to be first, they wanted to be the lead, and they got taken. And this was an interview with uh, the then chief of ABC News uh, who was talking about the, the problems that they had had and how they were trying to prevent it. Well, I, I will talk about a little later that some of the news organizations in 2016 were caught by the same thing in this race to be the first and this race to try and be objective in their view uh, they were misled by foreign disinformation now uh, I kind of want to lead in tonight uh, and I'll, I'll explain those of you who haven't seen these some of the great fake news hoaxes of the 19th century the great moon hoax of 1835 it started, uh, you know, there's always a little truth to these things. There was a real scientific expedition uh, to take a look at what was happening on the moon. But this was what uh, was posted, uh, I believe it was the New York Daily News. I could have that wrong. Uh, there were people on the moon with wings and all sorts of creatures and things like that. And of course, um, you know, maybe the first Russian piece of disinformation, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Uh, what I'm hoping to do tonight in, in the time I have is three things uh, by way of a quick trip through history which we've already started. First, I obviously want you to walk away understanding that what's new is old. Um, the disinformation, the, the orchestrated political warfare campaigns we're seeing domestically and internationally are not new, and, but actually learning what happened in the past can help us to identify and potentially solve uh, the current problems. Second, uh, specific to the Russian attacks over the last five years or so. Uh, I want you to walk away understanding that these were not haphazard. They were not necessarily designed only to uh, manipulate a political campaign for a specific candidate, but more on that later. Um, but they are part of a deliberate and calculated campaign designed for Moscow, designed to advance Putin's foreign policy objectives. This isn't just to make us angry. There's, there are specific and tangible goals there, and what I think is important is being able to link those as you see other things going on in the news. And my third point, all this doesn't mean we can't mitigate the problem, we can't deal with the, that we can't deal with the damage. I think we can also reduce the likelihood that disinformation in particular is effective when it comes to, the, when it comes to all of us. Uh, and I'll explain some specific ways I think we all uh, can address them. Now, um, the events of 2016 uh, were, of course, not the first time uh, the U.S. was impacted by a foreign disinformation campaign, uh, nor was it the first time that um, presidential politics became involved uh, uh, with a foreign influence campaign. In fact, uh, the uh, Washington Post columnist David Ignatius wrote a column back in 1989 talking about how an American president had become aware of a foreign disinformation campaign designed to influence the United States to go to war in 1939 and 40, and actually that American president didn't do anything about that foreign influence campaign. And of course that foreign, that uh, president was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and the foreign actors were the, the government of the United Kingdom. Um, and it was not just overt propaganda or diplomatic uh, missions designed to convince members of Congress or members of the administration to come to Britain's aid and go to war. It was also covert action 
designed to discredit isolationist members of Congress. And if you go back and look at the papers, you can find, uh, there's actually a great book on this too, but you can go back and find out that, wow, there were a number of isolationist members of the US Congress who all of a sudden were found in scandalous situations, whether it was with prostitutes or with uh, crazy financial transactions that looked illegal. Guess what? Courtesy of Her Majesty's Secret Services. Um, you know, it was a fairly nasty campaign. But again, a little bit different as we might say that they were well-intentioned. Uh, you know, they were trying to bring us into battle against uh, a totalitarian state, the Nazi government. But in any event, um, I think uh, the history of the Cold War provides a little bit better guide, though, uh, to how the Russians in particular used disinformation along with active measures. And that's a term you may hear referring to political subversion and sabotage. So think of uh, you know, propaganda as the, as the spoken, whereas propaganda of the deed, the action. If it's good, um, we might say propaganda of the deed. If it's bad, we might call it active measures. In any case, uh, during the Cold War, the United States, of course, had its own propaganda campaigns uh, and embraced measures uh, short of war known as political warfare. Uh, this was both overt in terms of things like the US Information Agency, uh, Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, uh, and they operated uh, under what was known as the strategy of the truth. Uh, we felt we had a strong enough position that if we promoted a free exchange of ideas in Eastern Europe be behind the Iron Curtain, this would damage the Russians. And frankly, the Russians, uh, the Soviets then and the Russians today agree with that. Attacking our programs today, such as those uh, run by the International Republican Institute and the National Democratic Institute to foster good governance and good and strong civil society. That's why these organizations get kicked out by uh, by uh, autocratic rulers all the time. Uh, yes, the United States did some other stuff too. Uh, most famously, uh, the covert action for the Italian election of 1948, where essentially we bought out the you know, bought off the communists to make sure that they didn't win the election of 1948. But uh, the Soviet strategy, uh, if if you would say that ours was 80/20, overt and truthful, 20% not truthful and covert, uh, for the Soviets it was the other way around. Um, they found that. Um, Exposing flaws in the American system wasn't enough, uh, notably the racial divide, but rather uh, Moscow felt it was important to spread deliberate disinformation to aggravate these seams in American society and to make the United States uh, look bad around the world and reduce our credibility. Now, uh, perhaps the most, uh, you can switch, flip here. Perhaps the most dramatic efforts came in 1983 when Soviet intelligence operatives spread a fake news story with a pro-Soviet Indian newspaper alleging that the AIDS virus was developed by, US, by the US government to target African Americans and homosexuals. Within four years, the story had been repeated in the Soviet Union and in outlets in over 80 countries and 30 languages. Even today, you see where news organizations won't necessarily take something that looks fake or suspect from a single source. But once it's printed in another paper, you know, Washington Post, well, look, you know, the, the Times of Delhi is reporting that, okay, that's a truthful story. But if you don't dig into it, you can perpetuate the problem. I mean, think of it as, uh, you know, think of it in the same way as uh, how viruses uh, are propagated around, around the community. You know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's sort of similar. And I'll get, that, I'll get to the vaccine issue in a minute because uh, this gets right to it. Um, now, the story did tremendous damage to U.S. credibility abroad as well as at home. Uh, at least one study as late as 2005, that's not a long time ago, found that almost 50% of African Americans believed that HIV was a man-made virus designed to wipe out the African American community. 2005. And you can track these links, and people have studied these and looked at the vectors for the propaganda, back to this KGB, and actually... To be completely accurate, originally it was an East German uh, propaganda attempt, but it, it's, it fizzled out. Uh, but it goes right back to these stories. Um, I have no evidence to base this on, so this is pure speculation. But I suspect that there are some linkages between the echoes of this story and some of the things that are out there in the anti-vaxxer movement today. Uh, what I do know is that every once in a while, you start to see echoes of this America's doing something bad in its labs, and it's designed to kill a particular target audience. 
Um, and the reason this sticks is, of course, we have a fairly sordid history when it comes to things like the Tuskegee experiments. So I tell my students, in every piece of disinformation, there's just enough of a kernel of truth or credibility to make it seem logical. For example, a couple of years ago, or back in the 1970s, uh, Soviet propaganda in Latin America was uh, focusing on the fact that Americans had a labor problem and therefore were, were, um, uh, were kidnapping Latin American children and bringing them to the United States to work. All right, I'll leave that one aside. Almost the same piece came out a couple of years ago, uh, but it said that uh, America was kidnapping children and sending them to Mars to work on Mars in a labor colony. Now, that one didn't quite hold. Again, not enough, not enough of a kernel of truth there. At the same time, take a look at something like this and think about, uh, I think it was actually in Boston during the Cold War where, um, where mentally handicapped individuals were given uh, radium uh, without their knowing as part of a government experiment to track uh, radiation uh, or how radiation moved. Um, and again, similarly with the Tuskegee experiments. So when something like this comes out here, you can't say there's no way it could happen. I might say that because I would say we learned from our mistakes. Other people would say, what are you talking about? Government is always hiding things. Well, it's, yeah, government, you know, we had the church committee hearings, all the crazy stuff going on during the Cold War with CIA covert operations. Just enough doubt to make something as ridiculous like this seem credible. That's how disinformation works. Again, as I said, it did tremendous damage, and I would argue probably the most successful Soviet disinformation campaign to this day. Um, now, this wasn't the first Russian effort to stoke racial tensions, the idea that the U.S. government was creating something to kill African Americans. Um, as uh, Christopher Andrews wrote in 1999 in a, a great book on uh, propaganda called The Sword and Shield, Moscow sought to exasperate the, uh, exacerbate the potential for violence between the white and black community by trying to push away the idea of reconciliation and driving both sides to the extremes. Um, in the hopes, the Russians hoped to create a race war, not arguments. They literally wanted a race war in this country. Uh, I'll quote you here from the book. At the height of the civil rights movement, Soviet intelligence first sought to discredit Martin Luther King because he preached racial reconciliation. Instead, the Soviets favored more militant African-American activists who might provoke a full-blown race war in the United States. Towards that end, the Soviets generated a propaganda campaign to depict King as a collaborator with, his, with white oppressors. And you can go back and see these things in the papers and in the, the uh, leaflets and the sheets and in the rhetoric used by more militant uh, arms, or by more militant uh, individuals in the civil rights uh, community, and you'll, you know, can trace these back to the Soviet line, uh, propaganda lines. Now, after King's assassination, the Soviets switched gears, claiming he was, you know, the person that the civil rights movement had needed, and they portrayed him as a martyr and sought to inflame the passions of the African American community that was already rioting in the American cities. In other words, the Soviets certainly didn't create racism in this country, but they took advantage of it and exploited it. And this was the prologue for much of what we've seen in recent years. If you think back, you can go to, to look at uh, Baltimore, Ferguson. You will find traces of Russian propaganda there, not creating it, but exploiting it. Um, and I'll give you a couple of interesting examples from, uh, uh, from recently uh, that, uh, where this happened. Um, now, Russia is going to continue uh, to overtly and covertly support organizations on both sides of an issue. For example, uh, during the Cold War, uh, the Russians supported the ultra-nationalist secessionists who wanted to uh, leave California or leave Oregon, form their own states. Um, whether it was on the right or on the left, it didn't matter if they were anti-government or, or pro-eco uh, to the degree that they fought, thought they had to se secede. You saw the same thing, just one example, uh, when you had the issue over uh, uh, in the NFL over kneeling for the American flag, the, the Kaepernick issue where the Russians were trying to you know, do pro-Kaepernick and anti-Kaepernick. And it wasn't, you should have an argument, it was, you should beat up your neighbor if they disagree with you. They were try, you know, seriously trying to create violence. Now, um, today, um, 
I think, you know, you see the divisions we have. It, it's whether it's uh, race, guns, LGBTQ rights, you know, anything that the Russians can drive a wedge into, they've tried over the past several years. So let me just kind of give you a, a quick rundown of how this, this history played out over the last, uh, last few years. You know, so much of American political, political dialogue takes place over social media. About 70% of Americans receive some sort of news over social media. So it's not surprising that that became a primary platform. I still argue, uh, based on what I've read from, from professors in uh, communications and journalism programs, that Americans, a lot of Americans still get their news from local papers, not even national papers. Um, but social, but even if you're impacted once by social media, you know, this, this can have an impact. Um, in any event, um, with so much of the political dialogue taking place over social media, it's not surprising that this is where the Russians focus their efforts. Um, the fingerprints of Russian disinformation campaigns are not just found in the U.S. in 2016, uh, nor in just the years uh, going back to 2011 in the U.S., but the Russian parliamentary election of 2011 may have been the first time where the pro-Putin parties started to use social media. Their targets were obviously other Russians. But uh, we've also seen the Russian hand in the Brexit uh, debate. And uh, we've seen it in uh, the Scottish independence referendum. Um, and there are echoes of it with the Catalonian independence movement. Um, it's all over. And the good news is, uh, as it was exposed, now people are a bit more sensitive to it. And it's a much more difficult for the Russians to do, do things in a subtle way without being exposed fairly quickly. The problem is um, that people are still deceived by, by what's out there. Now, um, in short, what we've seen over the past five years, a calculated uh, campaign of untruths designed to influence American attitudes and behaviors, a campaign exploiting identity politics that seeks to inflame uh, racial, ethnic, and economic divisions, and a campaign that, that I believe impacted voter attitudes during the 2016 election and quite possibly behaviors. By that, I mean the ballot box. Although, uh, as a good historian, I think that that's right now an unknowable uh, question. Um, and you've seen reports trying to assess the impact. I'm not sure anyone has it quite right. Attitudes, that's one thing. We can pretty well track attitudes in the uh, purple states, uh, especially Mich uh, Michigan and Wisconsin. There have been some great studies by the Oxford Internet Re uh, Research Institute on that. Um, but whether or not it impacted anyone going into the ballot box, that's just unknowable. Uh, that's just uh, in my view. What is no doubt, uh, or what is where there's no doubt, is that the Russians did interfere through a deliberate political warfare campaign. And I'll get to what those objectives of that campaign were. Um, but I, I do think it's important to quote uh, Robert Mueller's report, just one line. Uh, this was in his uh, uh, spoken testimony to Congress, and it's in the written report as well. Uh, and he puts it mu much more eloquently than I do. Quote, the Russian government interfered in our election in, sweeping, in a sweeping and systematic fashion. That's about it. Um, it happened. Um, as uh, Dr. Jim Lutis up at Salve Regina University's, or I should say down at Salve Regina University's, uh, Pell Center and I noted in, in uh, our report, uh, Shattered the House of Mirrors, and just to gloat, we wrote this in the middle of 2017 before there was a Senate Intel Committee report, before there was a Mueller report. Uh, we concluded the same. But we also said you have to go beyond Russia's well-financed and deliberate intervention in the election. This is part of a much broader effort. And if we only focus on that one campaign and the election, one, it's hard for most Americans to be objective about it. But secondly, we're missing the bigger picture. Putin's very happy to have us all focused on that, while there's a lot of other stuff going on as well. There is a Russian, deliberate Russian effort to undermine America's faith in its free institutions and diminish U.S. political cohesion across the board. Erode confidence in Western democracies overall. Uh, you even hear this out of the Chinese. See how bad democracy is? It's all screwed up. Uh, those of us who remember all the fun back in uh, November, December of 2000, you know, where no longer could we uh, say to everybody, you really run your elections in a screwed up way because we were having fights over hanging chads. Perfectly legitimate to have these debates in a democracy. It is wonderful. It is amazing that we were able to continue these peaceful transitions and our courts had to get involved. Whether you like the result or not, that's the amazing thing about democracy. And the Russians and frankly the Chinese want to uh, 
uh, would, would like it if the, if the Western democracies said, you know what, this is a really poor way to run a railroad. We need a more efficient way. Of course dictatorships are more efficient. Autocracies are easy to run. Someone says what to do. If we had a king, someone they would say what to do, and we would do it. But uh, the Russians also are seeking to diminish the credibility of Western of uh, the transatlantic relationship, to weaken it, to make sure that the United States becomes more isolated from Europe. And it's pretty obvious, given what I was just talking about, the Russians are still fighting that Cold War. The Russians are, especially uh, Putin and some of his cronies, were never happy that Gorbachev uh, gave away the farm in their view. And uh, there were a lot of people who argued, even in the 90s, that, well, we really shouldn't quite trust them. We can work with them on a couple of things, but that's it. This was actually a very big debate in the first four years of the Obama administration, but not a debate that was public, nor it was a debate that America cared about. But it was a real debate sparked by a concern that, yes, we were working okay with the Russians on a few things. Remember the, the whole reset button? Uh, you know, and a lot of people felt, no way. Putin's just biding his time. You know, even by the time the Obama administration came in, they had already invaded Georgia. And then, of course, uh, we had Ukraine. Now, um, the uh, final thing that, that they're trying to do, is, or the way I want you to think about this, is all these things are directed towards one purpose. Diminish the international appeal of the United States and reduce American power abroad. Putin doesn't care who's in the White House as long as either that individual or messing with our democratic processes works in such a way as to reduce American power abroad. In other words, we have to get beyond 2016 and think about U.S. national security more broadly. Uh, Clint Watts, uh, one of the more insightful scholars of, of recent things going on, uh, has noted that while Russia may take a lighter touch in the 2020 elections, they will still seek to play a role. Uh, their calculation, and, and I agree with Watts on this, is that uh, President Trump has done a great deal to weaken confidence in the U.S. abroad and create turmoil at home that keeps the U.S. looking inward. Likewise, he has allowed authoritarian leaders to find someone in the U.S. Uh, with whom to consistently engage. In short, we should expect the Russians to continue along the path they used last time um, by using what Watts calls the five R's. One, remind Americans of their missteps, and that means historically as well. So why not put that up again? Why not talk about all the horrible things uh, that uh, America has done while not talking about all the wonderful and great things the United States has done? Uh, second, repost, reshare, and retweet organic American content that supports the, Russia's agenda. Therefore, and this, and I'll be careful how I say this, Russia would like us out of Kurdistan, Syria, and not really playing around uh, in, in, the, in the region, in the Middle East overall. Well, some people have, you know, some uh, political uh, candidates have legitimate, and the American people have legitimate views that we shouldn't be there. And they're perfectly legitimate views, and they make a great case. So the Russians, so I want to be careful. When the Russians we retweet that stuff, the response shouldn't be, aha, they're a Russian troll, you know, or they're a Russian agent. No, the Russians are just retweeting what helps them. Doesn't matter who puts it out. They will also repurpose vitriolic American narratives to manipulate unwitting audiences. Um, I think a great example of this is their support of uh, some of the uh, uh, pro-Confederate movements. Um, they're happy to uh, promote those ideas. It's very similar to, again, the racial issues uh, that they tried to exploit during the Cold War. Uh, finally, they love repeating the White House attacks on other Americans because it sows more distrust. And finally, uh, routing conspiracies and alternative content through fringe populist information sources. I try and tell my students that, you know, there's a range from right to left media that, that you can take a look at. I, I don't have, you know, I may have an issue with particular uh, shows on Fox, but I find looking at Fox and MSNBC. Um, I like NPR, I happen to like NPR a lot. I listen to BBC, that's foreign though. Um, but there's a range of stuff. Where I tell my students to start being careful is when you're starting to look at things um, like Vox, which has a very tough political bent. It's not disinformation, it's just, it's uh, very polemic. Let's just put it that way. And where I have problems on the other side actually are some 
places where there is deliberate disinformation. Uh, and Breitbart's my, my example of that. I won't even get into RT and China Global TV and things like that, but you have to be careful. And it's really important that, uh, that people understand kind of you know, what a professional news organization is, what ombudsmen are. Uh, are these news organizations that will retract a story um, that where there has to be journalistic review? It's one of the reasons I'm not a fan of the um, single anonymous source story. If you have three sources that are senior administration officials that uh, chose not to be identified because of the sensitivity of the issue, as long as you have three, I'm good with that. Uh, although, uh, just prior to Iraq in 2003, uh, most of the major media outlets got played because um, it turned out the vice president's office was one source. Uh, a gentleman named Ahmed Shalabi, uh, who died a few years ago, an Iraqi, who was being fed the same information that the, the vice president was getting, and then usually one other source that was getting their information from Shalabi. So it actually was all the same stuff. And of course, that was the information about weapons of mass destruction being in Iraq. And uh, only one news organization, uh, McCla uh, yeah, McClatchy, um, got it right. Um, in any event, uh, that's an aside. So what do we do about, uh, so actually, let me have you, let me flip to the next slide then. Just to kind of uh, juxtapose some of the things from, uh, from today and, and from before, um, down, down here is another version of the, uh, the Soviet disinformation propaganda on the AIDS virus. But uh, up in the middle, uh, the anti-vaxxer stuff there, uh, deliberate disinformation, actually targeted specifically at Jewish families. Um, and, uh, you know, my little, uh, the nice, the South United site, which was uh, not come of the South in America, this came out of Russia. Uh, this was not, uh, just like this site, uh, Heart of Texas on Facebook was being run out of the Internet Research Agency uh, in Russia. Uh, likewise for blacktivists, claiming to be a more extreme uh, group associated with Black Lives Matter. No, it wasn't. Blacktivist was a Russian. Uh, who was trying to uh, uh, trying to get uh, trying to exacerbate uh, racial differences here? Uh, you know, it, it's it's the same today uh, as it was back then. It may be the messages that are slightly different, the dynamics that are slightly different, but when it comes to foreign propaganda, specifically disinformation designed to exploit differences in the U.S., it's still the same. It's based on trying to achieve a specific Russian foreign policy objective or a Chinese foreign policy objective, or an Iranian foreign policy objective. And yes, our allies tend to do stuff too, but uh, I've yet to find disinformation being the way our allies do it. Uh, they tend to um, uh, help, well, the way you do it if you're an ally is uh, you take your company that, let's say, makes airplanes, um, let's just say Airbus, for example, move your, just hypothetical, move your uh, manufacturing base, uh, manufacturing plants to the United States, employ Americans, and guess what? You just bought yourself a congressman, probably two senators. I mean, it's, that's how our system works, you know, through the, the market-based capitalist economy. So um, they, they don't need to have foreign influence uh, because you have a uh, product made in America by American workers, and guess what? In the end, it strengthens the European um, air industry. Uh, to be fair, actually, uh, I don't know if I should say I'm an, I'm an Airbus fan anyway, but uh, that's why I feel I can beat up on them and still be objective. Um, so what do we do about all this? In the battles to influence and persuade, we're going to hear a lot about cyber regulation, technical solutions, algorithms, but we have to remember that it's the human mind that is the center of gravity. We have to think about the public's individual uh, ability collectively and individual's ability to interact with the information that's out there, whether it's analog or digital. In particular, I think we have to make sure we stand by our greatest strength as a nation, and that's the free exchange of ideas. I am not a fan of regulating free speech at all. I think that's actually a, a slippery slope to nowhere. I am, however, okay with regulating political speech. Why? It's already regulated. When you turn on the TV, you have the great voice at the ad. You know, this ad is, uh, what are we getting now? Um, the uh, Joe Kennedy campaign supports this ad, or the, the Markey campaign supports this ad. I mean, great. When I was in Washington, D.C. in the mornings uh, a couple years ago, these ads just destroying the nation of Qatar used to come on all the time. Uh, Qatar's working with the North Koreans to try and kill Americans, you know, pictures of, of, uh, of uh, 
the North Korean and, and uh, Qatari leaders near each other, all, you know, evil music coming up there. I'm like, who, the, who is doing this? You know, paid for by friends of the friends of the friends of the friends, the friends of Saudi Arabia, and then quick, it's over. <laughs> it's not transparent. We have to have some transparency. Facebook tends to take two or three steps forward and then one, two, or ten steps back. But um, they've implemented something, uh, well, they've said they're going to implement something where political advertising will have a green banner or entertainment will have a blue banner. Wonderful. Let all the disinformation, fake news, crazy conspiracy stories be out there on Facebook and have a blue banner or something or a red banner. So people know, ah, okay, that, that's, that's from a, that's entertainment. You know, treat it as entertainment if you want. Um, political ads. Um, I'm really upset with some of the major newspapers, uh, which about a decade ago uh, st stopped putting the bold highlighting in the stories that said news analysis. That was an indicator that, all right, this first paragraph is factual. Who, what, where, when, how, why, and we can document it. Now we're going to give you a little analysis. That's fine. And I don't mean analysis like an op-ed, but just some analysis. They took away that little news analysis piece, and it's harder to tell what is, you know, might be impacted by the biases of the individual reporter and what is straight fact. And I think most people who read papers can cut through that, but what about people who are just starting to learn how to read newspapers? And finally, I hate the fact that, um, and I will pick on the New York Times, that the font they use on the paid ads on the website is the same font Times New Roman that's used for the uh, for the news. That that's causing that's muddying the waters a little bit in my view. Now, um, uh, I do think there's there's maybe some need to regulate dark money. Uh, I would never say this say this if I were in the state of Delaware, uh, because Wilmington is kind of the, the capital of dark money uh, in our country because it's so easy to form a corporation. And what do I mean by this? Um, actually, uh, your neighbor Senator uh, uh, Whitehouse. Uh, is really focused on this. And the problem is, if I'm the Russians, and Facebook's told me, oh, you can't run an ad if you're a foreigner, or I'm going to treat you differently, all right. I established my company in Delaware. I spent a couple of years creating a front organization. You know, think of a classic Godfather, Goodfellas, or, or Sopranos thing. You know, set up the front company, and I'm doing a legitimate business with Americans. And guess what? All those profits, yep, they're funneled into Facebook ads and things I want. Uh, to say things. Now, frankly, foreign intel services don't usually spend that much time, and these fronts are easily penetrated. But we still have to go after this dark money because they are getting a bit more subtle. Uh, secondly, um, there might be need for changes, as I suggested, in the traditional news arena. Even professional news organizations can be taken by fabricated stories, and uh, there are debates over how many anonymous sources you should have, but also um, the news organizations during 2016 were unwilling to share information with each other when if they had, they would have discovered that they were being played by some of the same sources of information. Um, you can understand, newspapers are a business and sharing your you know, confidential sources and things like that uh, is really tough to do. Hell, when, as an intel officer in the Navy, when we would sit around the table, the different agencies would never share the names and details of their sources with each other either for, for good reasons. but. But again, now we're going to ask newspapers to try and do the same, but it's, it's going to be tough, but they're going to have to think through this. Most importantly, though, and I cannot overemphasize this, uh, we have to begin as a nation a concerted effort to properly educate the American public about the disinformation campaigns and about how prevalent disinformation is in our world today. And this is going to require a focus on civic, historic, and media literacy. Let me give you one example. Uh, I think it was uh, two years ago, the Washington Post reported uh, out a new poll that found that two-thirds of American millennials, and I'm sorry to pick on millennials, uh, surveyed, could not identify what Auschwitz is, and 22% had never heard of the Holocaust. And um, the same study also found that knowledge amongst most adults of the Holocaust simply isn't robust. Well, we know the Holocaust is one of those things that is a frequent target of disinformation, never happened. Uh, six million plus Jews, Gypsies, Roma, others were never killed. Um, that, it, that, it's a, uh, that it's a plant. I mean, these are the same people who will tell you that uh, the Earth is flat, there was never a moon landing. Although, those of you who remember the old O.J. Simpson movie, Capricorn One, you know, that sowed a little doubt in my mind. Um, so when we land on Mars, I want to make sure that it really is, you know, it's landing on Mars. But in any event, um, and, and more seriously, 
the historical education has to be there because it's not just going to be things like the Holocaust. I can tell you that we are already seeing 9-11 fade from memory. Weeks after 9-11 came the first disinformation. Ostensibly a French researcher said that there was no way a jet aircraft could have flown into the Pentagon. It's very clear that it was a cruise missile. Well, I was there. It wasn't a cruise missile. We were picking up parts of American Airlines and it was very clear what it was uh, out there. But in any event, Remember, our freshmen were born after, most of them were born after 9-11. Next year, our freshmen in college, all will have been born after 9-11. That means that memory has, you know, really started to fade. Because think, even some of my junior graduate students were only in second or third grade. You don't really have a functional memory uh, when you're in primary school of these events. And as these things start to fade from memory, they will be rife for exploitation by disinformation. That 9-11 didn't happen. That all the Jewish people were warned in the Twin Towers to leave, uh, or that it was a controlled demolition. There was no way that steel could melt. I mean, these are the reasons we have to teach our, our young people about history. Now, we also have to teach them a little bit about civics and how government works. When you don't understand how government works, whether it's state or local or federal, you can become, very quickly become a believer in conspiracy theories. And uh, as much as I have no problem picking on the current administration, I don't want to do it too much, uh, but this idea of deep states and bureaucrats uh, who are so somehow running the government. I've served in federal government. It is mediocre at best. <laughs> there is no way that the, I've, I tell one of my uh, relatives this all the time, there's no way the federal government's going to come get your guns. They're never going to figure out where you live, you know, is the first place. Um, it's, you know, I jest, but our, our founding fathers were so wise in terms of creating uh, not just, you know, we say a balance of powers. No, creating direct competition where the three branches uh, are competing with each other all the time and clashing over things all the time. Usually just the legislative and executive branch, but, you know, our Supreme Court uh, and our, our judiciary uh, branches had great influence on, uh, on, on events in the United States at, at, at key times, for better or for worse. And, and I think if you don't, again, if you don't understand how that works, you may say, well, somebody's doing this really to stick it to me. This must be everybody out to get me. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether it's, whether it's trade, education policy, tax policy. I mean, tax policy, my God, how complicated is this stuff? Thousand page bills. That's just stupid. It's not, you know, it's not uh, nefarious. Well, um, you yeah. know, it's, uh, again, uh, and then the third piece, of course, uh, media literacy. And this really is going to require um, a great deal of effort at the K through 12 level. Uh, Stony Brook University out in Long Island, the, the former SUNY Stony Brook, has a great media literacy campaign. But they focus on primary and junior high school because they, their belief is that by the time uh, you get to be 18 years old, it's very difficult to change your preconceived notions about what is uh, trustworthy media and what's not. I'm not as much of a pessimist on this. I, I actually believe that. Not only does it require significant efforts at K through 12 level, but look, organizations, whether they're World Affairs Councils, whether they're the American Historical Association, uh, Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs, anything you can think of out there that's an organization can help launch a literacy pro media literacy program for its members. There are wonderful websites out there um, that you can uh, go look at where you can do a media literacy game uh, and test yourself. I had my students go through a uh, game where you actually are the purveyor of fake news. And what it shows you is if you do too much fake stuff, your audience goes down. But if you don't do enough fake stuff, your backers won't support you. And it actually shows you, you know, a little bit about how, how this might work uh, in terms of it being a market-based problem. Um, finally, um, the ability to evaluate information in the end is really an issue of critical thinking and healthy skepticism. And Things that are deliberately deceptive out there need, well, there's so many things that are deliberately deceptive out there. We need to really be more conscious about thinking critically about everything they read. Um, like, likewise, um, I think that's lacking in our toolboxes and our education system. And I'm not saying that this is easy, that all of a sudden you educate people and everything's fine. No, it's not. This is a layered defense. Some regulation, uh, some new norms, some technical solutions. I think outing disinformation is incredibly important. And I keep coming back, again, as a historian to what President Eisenhower 
um, you know, did when faced with this problem. Uh, one of the first things um, he did was um, put together the National Defense Education Act of 1958. Now, this was because he was concerned about Sputnik and Soviet advances in math, science, and technology. And, you know, Eisenhower believed those skills were critical to keep pace with the national security threat of the day. Well, where's the, the humanities version of that? You know, the humanities STEM, if you will, to deal with civic literacy, to deal with historic literacy, to deal with media literacy. That needs to be out there as well. Um, the other thing Eisenhower did was he was very aware that the civil rights uh, challenges were causing this massive rift that the Soviets were exploiting. And he said, look, if there was no divide, the Soviets couldn't exploit it. Well, yes, Eisenhower couldn't just snap his fingers and fix the, the, the issues of, of racial divides in this country. Uh, but I was thinking about something that um, Google's chief evangelist, uh, Vince Cerf, he's one of the fathers of the internet, uh, said at a conference I was at, he said, quote, if you don't like what you see in the mirror, it's not the mirror you need to fix. He's right. Some of this is going to require very difficult, um, a very concerted effort and it can't just be checking the box. You can't put up, oh, fix civil rights. But what it means is that even if you address all the disinformation problems, you're still going to have vulnerabilities there. And in that way, I think we have to understand that not only has disinformation always been with us, but always is going to be with us. It's just a matter of if we understand what it is, we might be able to deal with it. And I think uh, probably the best way to conclude, to, to run us all the way back in history, um, at the about 100 years, at the 100 year anniversary of, um, I'm sorry, at the, uh, the uh, 400 year anniversary of Gutenberg's printing press, uh, it was actually the, the opening of the Gutenberg Museum in 1900. Uh, Mark Twain was asked to uh, make a statement, uh, talk a little bit about you know, how important Gutenberg's printing press was, and he wrote a few letters, and they basically said that, look, this was the incomparably the mightiest event in history but it brought with it not only a new and wonderful uh, earth, but a new hell. I mean, that was pretty blunt. Uh, Twain eloquently recounts the details, uh, developments, and marvels that this new hell or new form of communication had brought. Uh, quote, the press found it truth walking and gave it a pair of wings. It found falsehood trotting and gave it two pair. It found science hiding in quarter, corners and hunted. It has given it the freedom of the land, the seas, and the skies, and made the world's welcome quest. It found the arts and occupations few and multiplies them every year. It found the inventor shunned and despised, but it has made the inventor great and given him the globe for his estate. It found religion a master and oppression. It has made it man's friend and benefactor. It found war comparatively cheap and inefficient, but it has made it dear but competent. It has set peoples free and other peoples it has enslaved. It is the father and protector of human liberty and yet has made despotisms possible where they were not possible before. Every technology, whether it's the printing press or the internet, will bring with it new challenges and of course humans will use it for good and bad, but in the end this is still about human beings. Human beings with the ability to think, to debate, to deliberate, to be rational, and the best defense to end or at least mitigate the scourge of disinformation is to use our minds to think critically and be thoughtful and frankly above all else to be skeptical of almost everything out there that we're reading. I'm hoping we're not going to be skeptical of the Nats second victory tonight though um, as we move forward in the World Series. So, thank you very much and uh, I look forward to answering your questions. Sir. Uh, you mainly focused on the Russian influence and uh, propaganda in the American system. Are there other actors which are also active and what did you say the effect of uh, such influence from China? Yes, I, so a couple of things. Um, there are other actors, they're not as good. Uh, for example, um, the Iranians have tried to set up Facebook sites to have a little bit of political influence, not so much to be uh, divisive, um, but again, to have some political influence, uh, they're not good. They're, they're, um, if you think about um, what allowed people to catch some of the Russian sites, words were misspelled, not the proper vernacular, grammar, or the wrong picture may be associated uh, uh, with it. And so, so they just haven't been as, as good at that. But they'll get better. They'll get better. 
The Chinese are much more subtle and looking at things much more long term. Uh, for example, even in Washington, D.C., there's a little Chinese, English language Chinese newspaper, uh, government newspaper that is free that you can pick up and learn about the world's events. Well, it's in English. It's not meant for Chinese expats. Uh, CGTV, formerly CCTV, China Global Television. Um, high production values, broadcasting in the United States as opposed to RT, Russia Today, um, very low production values and not really doing much. But, uh, you know, CGTV has a lot of real news, a lot of very objective news. Now, uh, bring on an expert, a uh, U.S. expert on Asia to talk about the um, uh, riots in Hong Kong, you're not going to really get that. But, but they're trying as well. Where, where I think I worry about the Chinese more, though, uh, two things. One, uh, their soft power, their cultural power. For example, how many communities now have Confucius Institutes or Chinese immersion schools paid for with Chinese government money? Now, I am all for learning foreign languages. And frankly, Mandarin's probably one that Americans should learn. Um, but at the same time, we have to understand that the price that we may pay at some point. For example, you know, the way I would put it is, um, take a you know, failing school district, uh, D Detroit City Schools, uh, nearest metro city to where I grew up. Um, hey, Chinese government comes in and says, look, we're gonna, we're gonna help you. We're gonna help stand up all these magnet schools. They'll all be Chinese language schools, um, and that, that should help you out. Oh, that's wonderful. A Couple years later, you know, we need you to change these maps. These all say Taiwan. They should say China. And that demarcation line with Vietnam isn't right. Well, no, we're not going to do it that way. Well, I'm really sorry we're going to have to pull out, and you've been so reliant on us, not only do you lose the language program, but you lose the whole school. I'm worried about that. The second piece I'm worried about is Chinese influence uh, in the Asia Pacific. Uh, for example, um, the Chinese are behind a rather large uh, pro-Okinawan uh, independence campaign uh, to break off Okinawa from Japan. Now. Okinawans don't need any help arguing that they want to be independent from the, ja uh, from the Japanese mainland. That's, that's a legitimate grievance they have, and they're trying very hard. But boy, are the Chinese working overtime to make sure that happens. Um, and in Okinawa, that doesn't look at Japan as a patron, who are they going to turn to? Not the Koreans, but probably the Chinese. You know, so there, there's, a, there's a foreign policy objective there as well. So, yes, sir. Um, I just um, retired from the academia level. One of the things that I have really found with young people in college today is they're just not plain interested. You know, if it doesn't immediately affect their personal uh, realm, they're not interested. Regardless of how much you try to e expose them to the world events that are going on that you've made reference to, how do we stimulate that interest? to want to be educated and want to get involved and to be able to, uh, to, uh, to recognize that there are many different aspects to, a, uh, um, um, to an issue. So it's just, just not a matter of looking at one source, it's a matter of looking at uh, a number of sources. And there just isn't that interest at the college level. Do you think, they're ge do you think it's gen uh, genuinely worse than, let's say, your students in the 90s or the 80s or the, you know, or? You know, I, I'm just thinking of myself as a student, as an undergraduate student. I mean, I was, I had a lot on my mind. That that wasn't school, but um, but I agree with you. I do I do find it a challenge right now to engage my students, and and I don't, you know, I don't want to put this all on, on the different departments and different colleges and universities. But uh, there are a lot of debates. You look out in the chronicle of higher education. People are talking about how to edu how to engage, how to engage with folks. I think one, showing them that it's relevant to them. And I, this is a particular challenge with history. Um, how do I show my students, many of whom want to go work on Wall Street or Silicon Valley, that history is important to them? All right, let's use case studies. Instead of using something from uh, the Battle of Midway, let me use something uh, from, uh, uh, from Ogilvy advertising. You know, tell them a story, something about General Motors. Let me use a story that's different that illustrates the same point. I mean, that requires a read of the audience. I also know that I'm a believer in the big lecture still to get all those freshmen who may not be interested in history to become interested in history. But the amount of time that a professor has to put in to make a good, engaging lecture, a lot of academics don't, don't want to do that. So then that leaves us with seminars. 
And I think the challenge is there is using types of materials that speak to them. For example, as a military historian, uh, I teach a class on the American experience of war through literature and film. And what's very tough is if you look at the fiction and nonfiction from the Second World War, so memoirs and uh, let's you know kind of the great writers, uh, the Norman Mailers um, and Arthur Miller's of the Second World War period, it's almost all white males. Well, how's that going to appeal um, to a South Asian female in my class or first generation uh, uh, black American from Baltimore who might be in my class? I, I have to find other memoirs. Vietnam gets a little easier. What have I decided? I'm just going to use Iraq and Afghanistan next time I teach the course. Why? I can find the memoirs and the fiction written by, one, kids who are closer to their age, and secondly, ones who they look at and say, wow, that, that could be me. And, and I think that that could be me is really the final point I would emphasize uh, in terms of making it relevant to them. But this also might mean doing things that are, are maybe difficult or even uncomfortable for us to do. I, don't, I did not like using video clips, movies, and um, audio clips the first time I taught. I thought teaching, read books, read articles, and I'll lecture. Um, I have a lot more multimedia now. Um, one of my students, uh, there's a great book by Tim O'Brien called The Things They Carried. Um, one of my students asked if they could listen to it. And uh, I, I said I'd think about it. Turns out that, uh, let me get the name wrong, uh, Brian Cranston, uh, the lead, lead actor from uh, oh, uh, Breaking Bad, he reads it. He's good. He really brings it to life. I think I had 90% of my students do all the reading for that session, whereas it was probably about 50 or 60% when, when they just read it. Uh, so again, different, different approaches. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, you may not want to enter this question, answer this question, but I'll ask it anyway. What are the top two or three media, public, uh, either online or in print, that you feel offer the most fact-based reporting or information? You know, what I should have done for the last slide, there's a group that's done a, uh, a good analysis. And what they do is they, they have far right, far left, and then kind of center left, center right, and then in the middle. And I would go pick groups in the middle. Um, you know, no matter what you look at for print media, avoid the understand the difference between the op-ed pages and, and the regular news. Um, I'll use the Wall Street Journal as an example. Um, you know, factual. Um, you know, they, they'll live or die on the, whether they get that information wrong. Um, and you see the reporters every once in a while fight with the editorial board. That's a good sign. You know, just because someone does something to the right or to the left doesn't doesn't matter too much. So. And I think that works largely the same way with the Washington Post and the New York Times. When they get something wrong, let's put it this way, if they get something wrong, uh, it's going to be on Drudge and uh, other places too, and, and Fox News, and you'll, you'll have to report it. Um, I, if you are getting, if you're looking at TV, I stay away. I, I hate to say this because I go on there as a pundit all the time and I want people to watch me, but um, <laughs> Stay away from the cable networks. Um, they generally don't have news. It's commentary on the news from 7 a.m. I don't know what happens before 7 a.m., but from 7 a.m. all the way through midnight. Um, yeah, whether it's CNN, Fox, or MSNBC. Now, I love the Sunday shows. I don't care what channel you're looking at. They're all good. But look, it may have to be that we go back to network news, um, whether it's ABC, uh, NBC, and CBS. Full disclosure, uh, I have a close family member who works on one of those, so you know, I, I want to be careful, but it's a, but I, I think that they do a decent job of giving you straight news. Um, and, but I still think it's a variety, you ha horizontally, you know. So if you're reading about what's happening, uh, I mean, how, how do you not read the papers and not see what's happening with the, this uh, Ukraine thing, go read a couple of different papers, see a couple of different views, um, but if you know which ones kind of lean right politically, which lean left politically, you can balance yourself out. The other place I think you can get good news is, is FT, Financial Times. Um, BBC, you can get good news about every place but the United Kingdom, and, um, <laughs> and they're, they're even having some challenges, but you know, BBC was founded to be a propaganda, propaganda instrument of the British government, but their strategy was if you get people objective news, you can advance the, the principles of Western liberal democracy. And I, I do believe in that. 
Um, and I, you know, I, NPR gets hit once in a while, but I, that's my go-to. These are my personal views. I, I um, but I, I still think it's important to look at everything. Uh, yes, sir. Great presentation. But I'm going to ask you a question, which is outside of the scope of your presentation, but I think within the scope of your professional background. Okay. And that, and it's something. It's also a current topic. The, the, having a whole lot of trouble understanding uh, Kurdistan, the, the, the Kurds, Syria, uh, Turkey thing. Do you, do you have any? Can you, can you give a being a good, good at being a good speaker on this topic and, and not wanting to, as I understand, cause a greater war there, uh, I'll try and I'll try and link it uh, to to this here. Uh, you know, let me look at it from a Russian perspective. From the Russian perspective, um, you know, American flags went down, Russian flags went out. That's good for them. President Trump's actually been very clear and consistent on a couple of things from a foreign policy perspective. I want America out of foreign wars. Now, people like me argue, uh, yeah, I don't necessarily want to see half a million American troops on the ground for a needless war or war of choice, but American military presence overseas does a lot of good things, I, you know, so I want to see them there, so I'm not going to be objective about this. And I think that the decision was just Trump's being consistent. I want to get them out of there. I also think he does see things as transactional. And, uh, you know, Erdogan made a request. I think Putin also helped Erdogan to make that request. And now it's really under the control of, of the Turks and the Russians. I mean, I, I, I think you don't have to look too deeply uh, on that. But my caveat is that is definitely not my focus area. Uh, I have spoken about it publicly. In fact, uh, just the other day on, on uh, local public broadcast system, uh, I spoke to that. And I, think it's, uh, I do think it's consistent. I think it's problematic. Um, and and I, I, I think it, this is going to be one that uh, I heard someone say it today, so I, I just can't remember who it was, that this will be his mission accomplished moment. This one will come back and bite him in the rear. We'll see in a year from now. Invite me back. We'll see if, if that works. Yes, ma'am. I have a question on Sinclair Broadcasting. Yes. Um, who are they? What are they? Are they as insidious as people <laughs> seem to think they are? You know, it's, in some ways, I don't know. Um, I, I remember seeing a couple of stories about Sinclair where uh, they wouldn't allow local, local affiliates had to air national stuff, but I, I have to tell you, I'm not sure whether that's the norm in any case. I mean, I see that even on the regular broadcast networks. Uh, my comment would be this. Anytime you get too much of a concentration of media in one group, and look at the late 19th century in terms of print media with the Hearst newspapers versus the, um, the Pulitzer newspapers, I mean, you've got a problem. You know, they're, they're, they're going after each other to see who can make the, the yellowest of the yellow journalism. So, um, you know, I don't have any great expertise in that. Um, and I couldn't even tell you if turning on the local news which stations Sinclair or not. But what I will tell you is, um, you know, we're not going to get the market economy out of, of broadcasting like that. Look, it's why public broadcasting is so absolutely critical. You know, whether it was, uh, what, 30, uh, 30 years ago, the news hour, the McNeil Lehrer news hour, then just the Lair News Hour, you know, and uh, the News Hour today. I, you know, there, there's a reason that, that programs like that are important. Uh, to, and actually, it may be dry. It's still dry, but wow, what sort of straight, unbiased news you have there? Yes, sir. It seems to me that what you're really talking about is trust, and uh, I think our trust has been severely damaged. I mean, it's hard for us to trust a an information source because it may be tainted by corporate interests or it may be tainted by political interests. I mean, are, are we, I, I think I, I agree with you historically, we're no different now than we were 500 years ago and, and, and they probably didn't have any trust then. And, you know. But I mean, are, are we at a, a, a much different point because of uh, you know, communication speed, uh, because of complexity, because of interconnectedness, and, and this, this trust that seems to be lacking uh, is just going to uh, do severe damage to, to, forget about the democracy, you know, just society in general. Well, you know, this, this, 
linking this back to the Sinclair comment a little bit, you know, if Jeff, if Jeff Bezos and Amazon owned way too many newspapers out there, yeah, that might be reason for, you know, you always have reason for concern, especially, but how can you tell whether it's a good newspaper? If they're critical of Amazon, you know, if they're willing, willing to write the article. What, NBC just the other day uh, with this Ron, Ronan Farrow uh, stuff, you have the NBC uh, anchors and commentators hitting their executives hard. That is the sign of a trustworthy organization. I actually, I, I didn't mention it here, but one of the recommendations uh, we toyed around with was, what's the equivalent of the Energy Star seal of approval for media? And there actually is a former editor-in-chief of the Wall Street Journal and a few others who in New York were trying to come up with a media sort of labeling guide of sorts. Now, that comes with its own issue. I mean, these are going to be subjective to some degree. But could they come up with a set of criteria? Uh, I mentioned ombudsman before. You know, do you have a process for ensuring editorial control uh, is not at the corporate level? Uh, do uh, readers have um, a transparent and easy to find uh, channel with which to lodge complaints about the accuracy of an article? What is your process for retraction? Do you publicize it or, as most papers do, hide it like on page three or four? Noting the retraction, you know, we noted yesterday that we went to war with Iraq, it was Iran, we were wrong, you know. It's, um, but, you know, I jest, but some of these things are big there. And, and this is why there are, you know, there are some differences today. Uh, when you, all you had was the nightly news, you know, did they ever have time to do a retraction? No, but the cable news networks have plenty of time. The problem is, you might have watched one show and they do the retraction, you know, 30 minutes in versus right in the beginning, you might miss it, but I do agree. There's a trust issue, um, you know, politically. You know, really since the Vietnam War, when we suddenly realized our politicians could lie to us. But the good news is they were actually lying to us before that too. We were just too naive to understand it. So, yes, ma'am. How does uh, how does the U.S. respond to uh, Russian fake news attacks, and what's the most well, on the defensive, I think one of the, the great things to do um, are, as I described, this defense in depth, whether it is uh, trying to weed out that disinformation before it's posted on the platform, uh, or secondly, being able to counter it by pulling it down as soon as we discover it, and then thirdly, the education piece. So the audience that's reading it understands that, wait, I need to be a little more critical about it. Uh, on the offensive side, um, well, according to a lot of newspapers, and I have no reason to doubt these, um, the United States launched a pretty hefty cyber attack on the Russian uh, Internet Research Agency, uh, which, which reduced their capability. Won't do it forever, but if we do nothing, you know, you, ha you have to do, if you want to deter something, you have to raise the cost of doing it. So, one, if Americans had, you know, graduate level critical media training, it, uh, or uh, media literacy, it would be much harder for Russian propaganda and therefore much more expensive a proposition to launch that campaign. And if every time they did it, the lights went out in Moscow or St. Petersburg, they might say, you know, this, this isn't worth it. So there are offensive things that can be done and defensive things that can be done. But I also think this issue of our, of staying engaged in the world, if we don't stay engaged in the world, we can't fight this alone. You know, Europe has been dealing with this the same way we have, and the Latvians and the Bal and most of the Baltic countries, particularly the Latvians, have been dealing with Russian propaganda um, attacks at least for a decade now that are trying to split the divide between Russian-speaking Latvians and Latvian-speaking Latvians. So I think we have time for one more. Yes, sir. I'm going to go back when you mentioned uh, the Russian, uh, Russians, the Russian propaganda on both sides of this Pastor Nick Neeling um, incident in the NFL. Yeah. Okay, they were they were they did both sides. The question I have is, how effective was it, and how do you judge that effectiveness? Judging the effectiveness. I mean, there was just from the point of view what the Russians did. Right. You know, judging the effectiveness of propaganda campaigns is incredibly difficult. You know, the best at it are really from the advertising and marketing world, where there's a bottom line. You know, if I market, uh, you know, for my for um, uh, you know Chevy Cavaliers. All right, I know how many were sold before and after the marketing campaign. The problem with this is I'm not sure what the Russians were using as a metric. Are they saying we want this many violent acts as a result of, of um, the pro and anti Copernic stuff and get people to talk? I think what they were looking for is increased 
uh, animosity and extreme viewpoints uh, trending on social media as an indicator of how people felt in the real world. Was it effective? I think in that instance, it was effective in terms of the technique and addressing the particular audiences, but it was outed quickly enough that uh, Twitter was able to take down some accounts and that people were inoculated to it because they knew it was something fake out there that was happening. And once you understand that it's fake, it's not going to have, well, in many cases, it won't have an impact on you, but uh, you know, uh, there, there still, our preconceived notions are pretty tough. And once we have a belief in something, it's pretty hard to get us to change our minds. Well, thank you again. I, I really enjoyed this. Oh. Thank you very much. Digital World War by one of our previous oh, sure. uh, speakers, Harun Ola. Great. Um, Thank you very much. If you are not a member of the World Affairs Council, I hope you will join. And I can say quite honestly that one of the things we do is school partnerships from Duggan Academy to Western New England School of Law. So we, we sort of cover those bases as best we can. So in addition to programs like this and our partnership with the State Department's International Visitor Leadership Program, we do school partnerships. So um, if you are not a member, we're a cheap date, and there, you'll find a card out there. So thank you very much for coming this evening.